I think Mark and I were pretty, pretty synchro. Good? All right. Do the recording. Yes. All right, good. Why did you save one for Avery? Okay. Have fun with these. No, uh, you're setting them up, bro. I'm presenting. Give me the one. I have to get in my half. One more. Let's see. Yeah, I Okay. All right. Um. So. Everybody take out your cell phone. We're gonna need them. Does someone come on? Uh, jump on to msocrative.com and type in this code, which is Luke D in numbers. It's like in the bunk hat. I, I needed to remember it. Okay. Shh. Okay, so um, my mentor in research always told me to start with my gratitude, and he said, if there's, um, if there's a part of your talk that you never rush, it should be the thank yous. So there are a million people we need to thank um, for making this happen, but uh, for some reason you people get up every week and come here before school on Thursday. We missed the number. Five, eight, five, three, three, three. Did you not hear that roll that I was on? Everybody, that was a... That was really good. I was, you were going I was That was... Yeah. was you just screwed up that whole presentation, Maxwell. I'm sorry. Uh, you're going to be up here too one day, Maxwell. Uh, okay, so yeah, you guys get here every morning. Uh, I have no idea why you do it. Um, I like to think it's because of the science. I doubt that um, a little bit. But uh, whatever keeps you guys coming here, thank you. And uh, please keep doing it. Um, there's a lot of people that put this together now. Um, it started with Matt Berrickman and then John Jack Hickey, and now it's a team of people, including Jackson's, 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 um, Claire Putman, and Andrew Verdeska. Uh, we have the newest person to join the team, Strackman, who's gonna regret that soon. Um, and then to the people that have been supporting, the faculty that have been supporting us, uh, Maxwell, Torres, and um, the so wrong. <laughs> um, believe it or not, I've also had teachers myself. Um, these are some of the best um, that I've had. And a lot of what I do, including this journal club, is uh, based off of the things that they've taught me. So in case they watch, I want to make sure I thank them. So my talk's about addiction. and. Um, I thought that I would tell you first about how I came upon it, and in my professional life, it happened. It, um, I started when I was in high school on diabetes. Uh, when I moved to, um, after college, I, I worked from diabetes into obesity, kind of looking at the body side, and then in <coughs> obesity, I came across the kind of the mental side of it. And it was the first time I came across the idea that you could take a feeling something like hunger, or something like sadness, or something like depression, and you can put it in a tube, right? A plastic tube with a liquid in it. And then you can take that tube and you can put it in somebody else's head and make them feel that way. So that, that, that blew my mind, because I always thought that feelings were like part of imagination, part of something that was greater than science. But it turns out we're not that special. Um, we are just beings um, made of molecules just like everything else and our thoughts as important and as great as they are are possibly just a series of chemicals. Um, in my personal life I've come across addiction in a different way. So I think my first experience with it was when I was like four or five. Um, my dad, I think I had to go to the bathroom or something like that and my dad and I walked into a bar it was about noon, and there was a bunch of people at that bar, and they were all staring at the wall. They were all drinking. Nobody was saying a word, and nobody was having any fun. From then on, um, I think that's what my mental idea of addiction was. My mental idea of addiction was a person on skid row. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is kind of fighting that misconception. So some of the things that I talk about, you might not think, but it's kind of what I thought when I was growing up. So I'm trying to correct that. 
that idea in my own head. Um, more recently, a friend of mine fell to this, and um, she was um, she was a teacher, not here, and um, she was an all-state runner. She um, she played. and just kept going. She was tough, right? And she was awesome. Um, I don't know why you guys have such weird looks on your face. That was a great story, and uh, it highlights pers her perseverance. Okay. So, I didn't know it at the time, but she had a problem with pills. I saw her for the last time. Um, she's not dead, but. She called me one night and she said, I've been kicked out and I need a place to stay. And I said, have you been drinking? Have you have been doing drugs? And she said, yeah. Um, and she came over and this, this amazing person, this person that was so full of like vigor and strength was replaced by this, by a person who was talking about death like it was a Pop-Tart. Just nothing. She was like, you know, I was like, you, you've been kicked out of your house, you have nothing left, you have no job, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. She's like, yeah, I know, but whatever. I said, you realize that you're not healthy anymore, right? She's like, yeah, yeah, I know I'm probably going to die. And she's just, just very nonchalant about it. Something about the way she was talking, it freaked me out, and it's not till much later, until um, I came upon a project here to do a chapter on addiction, that I realized what was happening. So here's my attempt to connect the professional and the personal experiences. So addicts, the mark of an addict and the psychological definition of somebody who is dependent on a drug is a person who will go to a drug or seek drug behavior despite severe negative consequences and repeated severe negative consequences. And we're not talking about um, speeding tickets. We're talking about losing your children, your house, you know, going to jail, and risking your life. Those are the kinds of consequences we're talking about. The people continue to persist to seek drugs after consequences like that. So my question to you is, what are they seeking? Why are they acting so recklessly? Go ahead and answer that. I'd like to hear some ideas. I know it's a really tough question, so just throw out whatever you think. <coughs> Did you start the activity? Yeah. Sorry, start reading. Yeah. Seeking a high, avoiding a low. They want the high no matter how they can get it. They'll do whatever it takes. Are they chasing that first high, question mark, an escape? Ways to feel more highs because they don't get as high anymore. All right, so I think that um, our ideas about addiction are probably pretty similar. But um, before I go into it, I wanted to just talk about some numbers. So if you look at illicit drugs, that's uh, mainly marijuana, heroin. Oh, by the way, marijuana is addictive. So marijuana, heroin, meth, cocaine. Um, about 85% of the population will never use them. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, 85. Um, about 12% will try it, and 3% will become addicted. The numbers for alcohol, a much more popular drug, are much greater. So approximately, in the last year, approximately 51% um, of the population drank. That's represented by the orange and the red. 43% um, does not meet the criteria for dependence or abuse. 7.7% um, do. So the question becomes, why is 40% of the population able to pick up a drink? Why is 12% of the population able to pick up a drug? And why are those red pieces of the pie people that suddenly can't put it down? What, what is population like? Is it above 18 or 21? Population is defined as above 16. Um, this is the U.S. population. And just to give you an idea of 
If you take the red here and the red here, you add them up, it comes to about 20 million. Um, the population of Florida is 19.4 million. So that gives you some idea of the scope of the problem. So when we asked, um, when I asked you what most people were doing when they were uh, doing drugs, you said seeking a high. So imagine a piece of red velvet cake um, with cream cheese frosting. Um, maybe just a little bit of lemon in that cream cheese frosting to give it a bit of a zing. Um, <laughs> imagine getting it, imagine putting it in your mouth, and imagine chewing it. What that's doing is actually activating a center in your brain. Um, it's called a reward center, and it's really hard to get an idea of anatomical ideas in the brain. So I thought I'd use this 3D diagram to give you a good idea of how small our reward center is. That's it. Therein lies your drive for food, sex, water. Um, it is what gives you pleasure when you are seeking heroin, cocaine, marijuana, um, alcohol, and it may be some of the drives for gambling and other obsessive um, disorders. Um, it is also part of the reason you probably come to General Cross. <laughs> no, I spelled cocaine wrong. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's look at some science. Um, so I've, I've edited this graph just a little bit to give you, to make it a sim little bit simpler. So this is um, a study on methamphetamine, meth. And what we have is rats in two populations. Rats that have been fed meth for an hour every day and rats that have been sped, uh, fed meth for six hours every day. Um, they are hooked up to a machine that feeds them meth so they can hit a lever and it's administered. And what you can see here is that there's very different patterns of use, right? So you see, this is the one hour a day population. And they like meth. They do. Um, <laughs> don't do meth. Um, but their behavior and their use of the drug is very different than the six hour population. With the six hour population, you see a steady rise in the amount of meth. And some of you might be asking, is it just because this is the only, this is the amount of meth that they can do in an hour? And that's no. They, they could do more. Um, so there's two different behaviors there. The top, the white line, represents what we're talking about here. And what we're seeing here is something called tolerance. Now, the question then becomes, when you're seeking that red velvet cake again, are you trying to get that one piece and then satisfied? Or what the, or what the rats were doing, were they trying to get that red piece of red velvet cake over and over again? Were they looking for many? Were they trying to seek a higher high? So there's an experiment called an ICSS. And what you do is basically hook wires up to the nucleus accumbens. That's a reward center. Um, so a person who has a low threshold for reward, which means that they easily get reward, will require just a little bit of stimulation to activate that reward, that reward center. A person that has a high threshold for reward, which means it takes them a lot to feel rewarded, and this is chemically, will take um, more electrical stimulation. What we're looking here at here is basically the same experiment, um, but I found that it was, uh, I believe this is heroin. Heroin gave a bit of better or cleaner of a graph. And so this high here and this high here are the same high. That is not a greater high than this. So again, these rats are being fed heroin, not to the mouth, but these rats are being fed heroin, um, it's over a course of time, and as they use it, as time increases, their use increases. But again, they're not chasing a higher high. At this point, it takes the same rat, more heroin, to get to the same high. It takes more heroin to reactivate that reward center. 
Somebody have a question? Yes. Why is there such a high spike in the middle of the graph? Um, I don't know what that spike represents. I looked at it in, in all the data back to the original. Um, it, it's represented in uh, the original use as well. So this is a percentage. So I'm guessing something happened that day, whether it was a cage change or something that may have stressed them out. Okay. Anybody else? So, back to our red velvet. Um, we're going from one piece of red velvet cake and making us happy to five pieces, pieces, possibly making us the same amount of happy. This is where things get a little freaky. So this is active. This is the um, amount of activity in the nucleus accumbens. So this represents a lot of activity. This represents low activity. You feel a certain amount of pleasure in every day life. So as you go about your day, your reward center is active, and it needs to be active. In a normal rat, this is how active the reward center is. In, an act, in a rat experiencing withdrawal, this is how active meaning that there's a depression in the reward system. A rat in withdrawal is not experiencing the same amount of contentness as a normal rat is. What does that translate into? Back to our red velvet cake. Originally, we're going from regular to happy using one piece of red velvet. Um, now, we're going from depressed to regular using many pieces. So we're no longer seeking to get high. That's no longer the goal. The goal is now normal. And a little bit of the drug isn't going to do it. It's going to take a lot. But that's not the only piece of the addiction puzzle. There's a, there's a whole other piece. Um, it's not that simple, is it? <coughs> He's saying no. <laughs> um, there's a whole other center in the brain, other than the nucleus accumbens. It's represented by that green area right there, and it's called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is responsible for some of your stress and fear. Um, there's a hormone that's produced inside the amygdala called CRF. And when CRF is produced in the amygdala, you feel stress. You guys all know it. Who knows the feeling, and just raise your hand just a little bit, who knows the feeling like right before a test or quiz when you realize you're not prepared? Okay, I said raise your hand just a little bit. <laughs> all right. That's anxiety, that's stress. You guys all know that feeling. Now imagine feeling that amplified and all the time. All the time. I'm not talking about for an hour, I'm not talking about for a day, I'm not talking about for a week, I'm not talking talking a long time. That feeling of anxiety all the time. Combine that with the fact that you're depressed, that it will take you, and that you've learned that the way to get back up is with a drug, that you have to do a lot of that drug, and your goal is not just getting to high, it's again, just getting to normal. What you can see here is the idea of the stress. So these are addicted rats in black, and these are non-addicted rats here in white. Um, at this point, they've not been fed anything. Um, there's, they're not being given any treatment. So this is the level of drug use in an addicted rat. This is the level of drug use in a non-addicted rat. What they, were done, what they did here is they uh, feed the rat a stress blocker. So there's a hormone. CRF, it binds to a receptor, CRF1. And what they did was block CRF1. As they increased the amount of blocking of their stress receptor, what do you see in the trend of drug use? It's going down. It's going down. So as they block the stress system, the animal is using less and less of the drug. Well, how does that translate? So, 
We're aiming for normal. We're not aiming for high. It's going to take a lot of our drug to do it. But I said that there was something that didn't make sense about addiction earlier. It's this drive to do horrible things, right? So people will lose their children, they will risk their lives over and over and over again, put themselves in bad situations, hurt themselves. And I figure if it were just chasing a high, you know, if I'm actually reaching for that happy face and you slap my hand, there's going to be some point if you keep slapping it that I'm going to stop trying to reach for it. Unless I'm not looking for a high. What if something's behind me that's horrible? What if there's a psychological hell that I'm trying to get away from? That feeling of anxiety. That presents a better picture. If there's something behind me that I'm trying desperately to get away from, it makes more sense the lengths that I would take to get to there. Who thinks that paints a, uh, a little bit of a freaky picture of addiction? That's only the beginning. There's so many more parts to it. Um, and I don't have time to go over those parts, but I'm going to show you two of the most interesting parts. So, who's ever done something, or, or thought about doing something, that you know would be a lot of fun, that you really, really shouldn't do? Something that might be really enjoyable, but would get you in a lot of trouble in the end. Thank you, Vanessa. Verdesca <laughs> <laughs> has. Um, <laughs> when you do that, there's something in your brain that says, hey, no. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, it'd be fun if, no. <laughs> in addiction, or well, that part of the brain is actually the prefrontal cortex. It's the thing that's developing in you right now. In addicts, in people experiencing addiction behavior, um, this disorder, the prefrontal cortex is starts to has a problem functioning. Nobody's sure if that's pre-existing the condition, but it certainly gets worse in addiction. So you go from having the bad idea and to having that part of your brain that says no just having the problem. Again, that's not the worst. The worst is something called incentive salience. You guys all have a native drive in you, a, a very, very primal urge. If I try to kill any one of you, you will try to stop me. If I try to deprive you of food, you will seek food. If I try to deprive you of water, you will seek water. In the depth of addiction, that order, that hierarchy of life over other things has changed. Somehow, drug-seeking behavior takes precedence over the drive for water, over the drive for food, and over the drive for survival. Who knows what happens to a rat that is given free access to a drug? I'll take the drug and not eat. And then what will happen? It'll die. It'll die. A rat will continue to administer itself a drug, neglecting water, neglecting food, until it dies. Now I know it's a really depressing thought. I know that this is a really depressing idea. But the fact that they're researching and finding mechanisms that are causing these things is actually a point of hope. By blocking stress systems, by realizing that people aren't going for highs but trying to get back to normal, therapies can be developed. And there are some out there right now. Suboxone so is something, or actually, sort of naltrexone. Anybody? Okay. Um, well, there are therapies out there. Um, in my
researching of this, I have done a lot of different types of research. I have met with many people in active addiction um, of all kinds, um, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana. Um, and I've read a lot on the subject. So if you've ever wanted to ask a question about drugs and what they'll do to you, I can answer that now. I do have to say that what I'm talking about is the commonality between all the drugs. So alcohol, for example, will do more to your system. It'll do more than just what we've seen. But all the drugs, all the drugs of addiction will do this. Questions?